birthday, 12, 30 p.m. I'm Paul John Dykes, and I'm joined by JP Mason for the Axon Bulletin. Welcome back, JP. How are you doing? Hi, it feels a bit weird not to be in the studio after a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks uh, in a row in the studio, but um, things maybe getting a little bit back to normal uh, this, in this neck of the woods, hopefully in the whole country. Um, so, um, yeah, um, but I'm doing all right. I've just... Uh, been uh, at a couple of football matches this week, <laughs> one in uh, Airdrie and one in Manchester. So, uh, right, we're going to have to, we're gonna have to touch on that. We definitely will touch on your wee whistle stop tour, JP. Um, but I mean, the last few weeks has been topsy turvy. The emotions have been up and down. I'm not going to use that cliche of the fairy ground ride right? because I always feel that when it comes to COVID, it's not like a roller coaster. It's like being on the waltzers, um, you know what I mean? And getting spun around every time you think that you're coming back to normality, somebody's spinning you around again, you know? That is a bit, yeah. Can I just stop you? There is some sort of noise happening at your end uh, just before anybody in the comments points it out or before somebody points it out when they're listening to it later on tonight, being like there's an annoying sound. It's like a rustling sound. Is it? Yeah. There's nobody, there's nobody in the studio eating crisps at this moment in time. How's it sounding out there? How's it sounding? Uh, let us know what the audio is like. Let me just double check. And I'll tell you right now why that is. That will be better now. JP? Yes. Yep. That's, yep. Uh -huh. Thank you for the technical advice. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I was coming through some other mic in the studio, but I'm coming through this one now. So thank you for that. And apologies. Uh, apologies. Anybody out there? who was uh, perturbed by the poor sound quality. Loads to talk about. We're in fine fettle today, JP, because last couple of weeks there has all, there's been this cloud hanging over us. What if we don't get back to the games? That cloud has evaporated. We're back on Monday. But before we go back on Monday, you managed to fit a couple of games in. Um, a cold Airdrie. Shysbury Excelsior, Penny Cars, whatever it's called now. Um, and you watched the B team. I did, uh, yeah. First, Decent first, performance. First foray into uh, the B team experience. And, uh, you know, it was good. To, it was, uh, well, one, it was just good to go to a game mm. full stop, you know, because you can say what you want, you know. You can watch, I, I don't know if I would have enjoyed watching that on the, on the live stream in my flat <laughs> on my Jack Jones, you know, so went along, ended up bumping into a pal, Brian, who listens uh, to the, to the podcast. Um, I sat Thank next you, to Brian. Him. I was sat next to him on the bus going to Wren. And um, that's where we met on the, uh, I forget the name of the bus, but it's the bus that runs from the Gallagher from Barstow to Seven. <laughs> you, you, you can imagine, uh, you can imagine the scenes in that bus. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Brian and I were of the, the team variety on that bus. Uh, we were about halfway down. A anything from about four or five rows uh, to the back was just uh, sheer chaos. But, um, you know, each to their own. <laughs> um, but I, so I met Brian a bit. Well, I watched the B team and I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the first half in particular I thought was, was good. And um, I was impressed with uh, the boy Brooks and uh, Wiley as well. The, the two of them, I kind of, you know, did my my uh, player cam and sort of honed in on them. I just, I, something that happened early on in the game made me think, right, I'm going to watch that guy. So I watched him and uh, watched his movement and had good, uh, number eight he was, and uh, had really good game intelligence, good passing. And they all just looked, it all looked very urgent. You know, it, it, it was it was quite weird watching sort of like a replica, obviously not as good quality replica of the first team, but you can see that they're, they're all, you know, doing the, the same thing as the first team. You know, the mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. the formation, unless I'm mistaken, was <laughs> was the same. So um, yeah, they, they, they look good. Joey Dawson up front looked like a, a unit. different uh, animal compared to the rest of them. Like he doesn't mm -hmm. look in the same age category. When you see them in real life on the pitch, like he looks so big and you know ahead of them in physicality and and everything else and height. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. Amy will be able to tell us better what the quality of uh, Caledonian Braves are. I, don't, I certainly don't rate their strip, as she said. Um, uh, but I don't know. What, I don't know. Have no idea how good they are as a team. So whether that two 0 victory was a, a good result for Celtic or, or or not, I can't confess to be that knowledgeable about the current state of of the week. But I just enjoyed it as as you know what it was. Um, 
I passed uh, former Rangers defender Craig Moore on the way in as well. It was an interesting mm. uh, spot. I, I think he is he an agent or something like that. I don't know, but um, I, I saw him anyway. And you know, it, obviously there was no real atmosphere at the game. It's it, it would feel it would feel a bit weird if people were starting chants or songs at like uh, you know a five hundred strong crowd, four fifty strong crowd in an in, in on a Sunday afternoon. I think. You know, it would have been a bit odd, but, you know, it was well attended and it was good to see people out and just sort of braving the elements and supporting another arm of, of Celtic Football Club. The big thing about that is um, there has been occasions in actual fact, there's a few things you mentioned there about buses. Um, I always <laughs> I think back to my early days as a Celtic fan and some of the experience on supporters buses. And JP was nothing short of an education in life. Mm. And I always look back fondly on those days. Um, and then when you're talking about this progression from B team to the first team, it's something that's been spoken about by uh, McIntyre and, and Darno Day as well. So I think that when you're looking at uh, the performance of that team, you're starting to see a style and the philosophy, and it's one of the ones where it's one in, one out. That's the idea in any case. And part of that is obviously a philosophy or an ethos. And a lot of people were concerned, a lot of Celtic fans were concerned that it's going to be difficult to create that uh, from Ange Postecoglou when he is, in essence, the figurehead of his own philosophy and he's not been able to bring his own staff and it's been spoken about time and time again. But slowly but surely, he is building behind the scenes, not big name appointments, appointments in areas uh, that will assist fitness, data analysis, etc. And of course, the under-18s now have a new coach uh, who has great knowledge of Ange Postecoglou from his experience playing over in Australia as well. So we have appointed the likes of Stuart McLaren. We've got uh, uh, Ortega as well. You probably follow him on, on Twitter, ex-Benfica. Uh, Anton McElhone already in place. Slowly but surely, is Ange filtering his philosophy throughout the club behind the scenes? Well, it seems that way, but I, I, just when you're saying about those names, I, I, I wonder, is he involved in the, the sort of interview process, the selection process? It's not something we're going to be privy to, is it? But... I mean, is it him just saying, right, just go out and get somebody for that position? Or is, yeah. he have, is he having a say over it? Like he's having a say over, well, certainly three of the four transfers that have come in so far, you know for a fact it's been said now, we know that it was him that um, sanctioned these and, and, and scouted them as well, probably. Um, so yeah, I wonder if those those appointments that are being made, is that within the remit of the manager to or the coach to do to, to do that, or is it from somewhere above? Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I, I, that's that's my answer to that. I don't know, but I, I'd like to think it is. I'd like to think that he has uh, some sort of say in it, rather than you know, because we've always said, I've always said, other people have always said that the only thing we wanted to happen at Celtic was that people were hired for the position uh, based on you know their 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 skills or whatever. You know, that yeah. it was. We didn't want people doing the wrong role or, uh, you know, being in the wrong position to do a, a job of someone else. You don't want the CEO getting involved in football affairs on the pitch. You know, you wanted the manager to do that, and you know, you just wanted every, every, everything, all the all the ducks in a row, so to speak. So, hopefully, that is the case with with these appointments, um, and there's not any disharmony or you know, mm -hmm. this is the guy you're getting. Like it or lump it, you know, I, 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 that can't surely be. Ha I know, I know that it happens in football clubs all over, but you know, hopefully, our club is uh, thinking differently on that front now. Yeah, moving out, moving away from that. I, I, th I hear stories of back in the day when it was the old Celtic Park fascia at the front before we redeveloped it in 1987. And often people would go to pick up tickets, JP, and there was a wee hatch, and sometimes the hatch would open and it was Jock Steen that was sitting there. You know, so talking about folk at the club doing other people's jobs, he'd be sitting in the office having a couple of, um, I think it was um, Jim Kennedy at the time, who was yeah. the, tic the ticket officer, and they'd be having, and he'd hand out the, the tickets. Can you imagine that, Jock Steen handing your tickets out to you? Um, going up to the stories of Tommy Burns going down and hanging out in the ticket office, isn't there? Like, you know, just having patter with people in the queue and things like that, which 
I mean, to, to have that sort of memory of Tommy Burns, if that was the only time he ever met Tommy Burns and it was because he came down to the ticket office to get something or give Aye. something to them. And then he, I, I, I can't remember where it was I heard that, but he went round everybody in the queue and had a conversation with everybody that was standing in the ticket office at the time. And, you know, I love it. I love, I, I love Tommy Burns' stories. JP, I mean, we had the great privilege of having his two daughters in here in the studio, and they were talking about how people used to go on about Tommy always being late for things. He said, but that's because he would never pass you. You know, mm. if a Celtic fan spoke to him, he would stand and spend time with him. Therefore, wherever he was going, he'd be late for it. And he was notoriously late for most things. Um, mm-hmm. And I know that obviously you've got fond memories as well. But it's, th- there is a feeling at the moment. There's a sense that uh, you're talking about getting your, your ducks in a line. Um, at the same time, you look at the headline, how important are the returns of Julian and Forrest to the title push? It does appear as though things are start, starting to fall into place um, just at the right time. As we enter the second half of the season, the fans are coming back to the stadium. JP, after one game, thankfully, where we weren't able to go against St. Johnston, um, and players' long-term injuries to the likes of Julian and Forrest, these guys are coming back. They played a, a behind-closed-doors game up at uh, Lennox Town, and a few people um, must have been in the know because they've been able to get some kind of information uh, from the game and, and put it out on Twitter. So we play St Mirren, we win one nothing. Young Owen Muffet scores a goal. Julian gets 45 minutes, Forrest is back. Our three Japanese boys all play. And I think that when you're looking at that particular... I mean, I'm not expecting... Uh, Julian and Forrest to be playing on Monday against Hibs, uh, incidentally. But how pivotal is the return of these two guys to Celtic's title push this season? Well, on on Julian, um, I guess the the time will tell as to how he is. You know, I mean, it's been such a long time that he's been out. And you think of the way that the landscape of the whole club has changed. You know, he, he now has to adapt to a new manager's way of thinking, new, uh, I would imagine, not rules as such, but, you know, there'll be new uh, sort of uh, guidelines, shall we say, for how players are expected to train and, and and you know, play and everything else, you know, obviously there's a new system. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how, how Julian's going to be. It's a, it's, a, it's a weird one because it seems like a million miles away, a million years ago that he cracked his knee off the post in that game. Mm. A silent Celtic Park. In a in a in a game that was really, although we won, that that was us kind of clinging on to title aspirations. Really, at that point, it was we won that game, and you're thinking, right, we go to Ibrox. You know what can we do at Ibrox? But then we lose him, and we have to play a makeshift defence, and it just didn't it just didn't work. And everything else was going so wrong at that time. You know, we would have needed to go to Ibrox with a full strength squad. Uh, or full strength first eleven anyway to have a real chance of it. Um, so him in his absence, there's been so many people have said people that you would <laughs> acting like they're in the know or whatever. I, I, this in the know thing seems to be getting flung about, and no, you know, maybe some people are in the know. I, I'm not. I don't think you are. You've not told me anything differently about about, about Julian or anything like that. But Julian has been touted as being someone that's not going to play for Celtic again. I've seen people. With you know quite an authoritative uh, um, kind of uh, thinking that this is that he was never going to play for Celtic again. Like oh he's away, he's done his contract will run out and he'll be away. But here he is. He played yesterday in a bounce game. He's on the verge of coming back into the squad. Uh, I, I just hope that he comes back as as I mean pe- remember remember you've said that people were saying we needed another centre half because Julian was was not. That great, yeah. and, and mm-hmm. our, 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 he wasn't that great. But our defence as a whole wasn't that great, and he he needed somebody else alongside him. So he's coming into a defence that has been criticised, but you know factually as the best defence has the best defensive record in the league. So you can't run away from that. Um, so he's certainly not going to waltz back into the team. But it, you know it, it's good to have someone of his of his. Uh, standing to come back in and, and be there to call upon should we suffer an injury um, because we've definitely been light on that front and we don't want to get to the point where you know we're having to play near beat on at centre-half because he's been playing well at, um, 
defensive midfield, you know, he, or or just midfield in general. He's been playing well, mm. which is his position. So, yeah, I think Julian question mark next to him. Forrest also question mark next to him as well because he's not really had a good run at it. We know what James Forrest can provide. I've always been a fan of James Forrest. As I've said before on here, the guys round about me um, at, at Celtic Park have given him a torrid time and gave him a torrid time. And even through gritted teeth, would have to sort of give him applause at times when he did something well or scored a winning goal against, you know, Rangers or in a European tie or whatever. Um, so I, I, I hope Forrest can shake off whatever it is that has been bothering him um, and, and come back and make an impact because, again, you know, we might have signed these players, but we're not, you know, it's not an embarrassment of riches just because Forrest is coming back. You know, Abada has been good. But Forrest, but Forrest can give you something that is, you know, potentially, you know, match winning. Um, and I know, I know, Abad has scored goals as well that have contributed to, to, um, to, to three points or progressing to another round of a, of a of a tournament. But but Forrest has has been there, done that serial serial winner. Mm-hmm. So many trophies under his name, and we don't have many of them in the squad. You know that a lot of those guys all left. So yeah, Forrest is one of the sort of last men standing from the, the most successful period that I probably will ever experience in my Celtic supporting life. And I think it's important to have certain figures from the successful period retained. Yeah. And, and I'm not just doing it uh, through romanticism. Here's a player, JP, who is in his 13th season as a first-team player at Celtic. 13th mm. season. He's played over 400 games for the club. He's contributed uh, to 200 goals virtually as either a goal scorer or providing an assist. So he is a game changer, like you were saying there. And I just think we've not had the luxury of having a full complement of staff. And people might say, well, you shouldn't expect that. I think that that's fair fair play to say that. However, you wouldn't expect the amount of injuries that Celtic have had in the first half of the season. I'm kind of pinning my hopes on the fact that there's been a, an upsurge of injuries due to the change in style, tempo um, at, at the training. And, and people have cited the Jurgen Klopp impact when he went to Liverpool um, as an example of it maybe taking six or seven months until the players' bodies adapt to the intensity of the training. And then what you'll see in the second half is less injuries. And I hope that is the case because we have been absolutely hammered by injuries. But just because of that, I wouldn't expect to say, well, we're going to be hammered in the second half as well. Um, However, it is always a concern with these two guys. I look back on Julien and I think about the important goals he scored, you know, in the cup final, league cup final against Lazio. And then last season, um, it's interesting that you brought this up because him and I were getting dogs abuse. They were getting real criticism around the Kilmarnock draw at, at Rugby Park. Um, around about that time, we need a new stri- we need a new centre half in. We went out and got Shane Duffy. We thought that was the answer at the time. It didn't work out for him, and then the injury to Julian. So he's had high and low points in his Celtic career already. And I just think if he comes in and he retains his match level in terms of the fitness, then we've we've got a, a real candidate for a, a first pick in the centre of defence. Interestingly about Beaton, it's not so much now you don't want Beaton to play at centre half because you don't rate him as a centre half. It's because he's, of his performances in midfield. And that's a big turnaround in itself as well, JP. Um, so that, I think that's an interesting point. Patrick Murphy comes in on the YouTube channel to make a point as well. It's only important if these two players can maintain their fitness. We've been hit badly by injuries, like like I was saying, Patrick, during the first half of the season. If we're pushed for the title, we need to ensure players aren't overworked. And and I think that I hope, and as I say, going back to the Klopp example, JP, mm-hmm. the worst of the injuries are behind us. Do you subscribe to that? Well, I mean, we can't predict how things are going to go with injuries because they're a bit random. But, you know, but ha- we ha- I mean, somebody counted them up. It was 18 at one point. 18 players were missing from those uh, the last two fixtures before the split. I mean, that's not many. I mean, I, as much as somebody was saying, my pal Chris was saying to me yesterday about the St Mirren game and going, I really hope we don't look back at that St Mirren 0-0 game at the end of the season and go, that's where 
we could have and should have, you know, that, that that's that point or those two points that we would be dropped there will make a difference. But I still think it's kind of a bit of a miracle that we got through that period without dropping more points because of the lack of cohesion. I know we're last minute winner at Ross County, obviously, um, but I mean the lack of cohesion and um, available players to play uh, <laughs> was 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 quite something. And you know, you wonder. Well, there's absolutely no way in the world that the team at the other side of the city could have coped with that level. I know that they're, they're supposed to have a stronger squad and all the rest of it, but I'm not buying that for a second that they could have coped in the same way um, that, that we, we did with, with that level of players missing. I'm, no. I'll put it out there. If, if one of them wants to jump on here and get all snide and start flying you know, comments about going, oh, check this maniac saying that, you know, um, if you really believe that, then, uh, then, then fine. But there's no way in the world they could have coped with that level of injury or, or players missing in that in that period. So to drop only those two points at St Mirren, which was all horrible, obviously, but I think that was uh, I think that was still a pretty great achievement considering you know where where we'd come from. Uh-huh. And and there was a, there was a guy on Super Scoreboard the other night. He got absolutely destroyed. I I, I listened to it now and then, and just out of interest to see what's going on, but. There's a guy, a Rangers fan, came on and said, "You know, oh, why is Celtic? You know, why are Celtic flying this season? And um, they've got the same points as they were on this time last season. So what's the difference? Why? How come they're flying this season? And then it was like a disaster last season. And Gordon Duncan came back and just completely destroyed the guy. And so did all the, the two panelists. And the guy was left with very little to say at the end of it because it was like, well, you, you've You've taken something that, yes, factually may be correct in terms of the points total, but the, the, the narrative of what happened was how, what, what Bostokoglu had to take over. The majority of our points were dropped in the first month, right? You know, like the Livingston game, Hearts, Rangers. You would expect in a turnaround and the amount of players that were turned over and we lost and brought in, that, that, that there's going to be points dropped and people adapting and everything else. We are in a completely different uh, uh, situation to, to the one we were in last season at this stage. Oh yeah, oh, um, yeah. not got Dubai as a as a as a thing that's absolutely decimated the squad going into the first games of the post split scenario. Um, we've not got the players that want away that were were said to be wanting away by the manager. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so we, we we don't have that doubt about people's um, character and the and, and hunger in the squad. Um, and we also didn't get spanked 4-1 home and away against a um, meagre side like Sparta Prague, no disrespect, but we held our own against Bayer Leverkusen in Germany. Mm-hmm. We held our own against Real Betis in Spain. <laughs> we beat Betis at home. Um, yes, the outlier is Leverkusen at home where we got um, royally uh, gubbed 4-0, but you know everybody that was at that game will know that that wasn't really a 4-0 game. And didn't come out of that, you know, head and hands going, oh, we're in a mess and blah, blah, blah. So, plus we were playing a very good side. So, that whole narrative of last season at this stage versus this season at this stage um, is, is is completely and utterly different. And the mood around, and, you know, we've seen the players that have come in and the, the way that they're buying into the club and they're, they're pushing towards something. Last season, it just felt like whatever we were going towards was getting further and further away from us regardless of what we did you know at least we feel like we can actually do something here you know it's completely you're right it's completely different circumstances last season it was unraveling this season there's a galvanization uh without a shadow of a doubt the signings as well there's another thing the signings we brought in weren't working last Mm. season what we've seen this time round, the signings that were brought in and making a positive impact as well JP so um, I think in a lot of these cases although the person might have been feeling foolish for coming on all guns blazing is um, empty vessels make the most noise and we we both know that JP and that's what happens now we're talking about going through that period of time if you were to have dropped two points would have taken it before that run of games I just think it was unexpected that those two points would be dropped against that opposition. And that was the frustration there. But you're right in what you say. We're going in against um, St Mirren with Mikey Johnson left-hand side, Owen Moffat right-hand side. We're going in against St Johnson with Kyogo pulling up with an injury and us having to bring on Joey Dawson to make his debut 15 minutes into the game. Mm. Um, so you're absolutely right. 
the, the squad of any other team, I would say, in Scottish football would not have been able to get through as unscathed as Celtic did. And I knew there was a few points dropped here and there. But in terms of the uh, points dropped and Angie's philosophy and galvanising the side, um, we were thankfully invited along to the the press conference for the three new arrivals and we got a chance to to ask them questions as well. And there's there's been a few interesting points from each of the players. First up, uh, Maeda uh, was asked about a, a potential partnership, JP, with Kyogo. And I remember earlier on in the season talking about Jota down the left, Abada down the right, Kyogo through the middle, the exciting uh, prospect of that trio going through the centre at Celtic's attack. But my idea, uh, from what I've seen and heard, and Kyogo is as exciting, uh, you know, a spearhead as anything I could imagine at the moment. Now, I know he's not kicked a ball for us competitively yet. But uh, by all accounts, Maeda, there was a surprise in Japan and, and through the press in Japan that he wasn't the first signing um, mm-hmm. from the J-League by Ange Postecoglou. We have got him in the door now. Are we about to see a slight change in approach in terms of the shape to get the two of them playing through the middle? Uh, I, I think it'll, I, I very much doubt he's going to completely change the formation because it seems to be pretty well drilled into the into the psyche of the players that are there already. And it would seem that Maeda can fit the system and, and you know, we'll obviously know how uh, the boss, as he calls him, uh, plays his football and uh, we'll, 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 want to, we'll want to adapt. You mean like playing two up top rather than yeah. three? And I, but not because it's the age old thing of why don't we play two up top at Celtic Park? I've heard it a million times, JP. I've uttered those mm. words myself. Mm. Uh, and I know that the modernisation of shape and the way that the, the game is approached uh, mm. means that very few teams play 4 4 2. And I, I totally appreciate all that. But yeah. I'm, I am looking at a tantalising prospect of Mieda and Kyogo playing together. And I don't want Kyogo to end up playing more kind of left because I don't think he's effective in, in that position. No, it, it definitely isn't. But um, I, 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 I don't know. I, it would be interesting. I mean, we'll see what happens on Monday. But am I right in thinking that Kyogo and well, I don't know. I think Jota's only just come back into the country. From what I'm to believe by somebody that told me yesterday, a friend, um, uh, that he's just come back from Portugal. Was that right? Did you did you hear anything about that? Yeah, and I mean, I've also read that Hugo's definitely out as well, which is uh, to be expected. Although we have gone into games, the the one against Leverkusen, for example, we go into that and you see the, the lineup before the game, McGregor and Kyogo both play, um, yeah. which was a big shock to everybody in the stadium, I think. But yeah, I wouldn't expect any of the two to be playing on Monday night. So Media will probably lead the line on Monday. Yeah, with a winger either side of him, probably. Um, mm-hmm. and, and he and he takes Kyogo's place, so... I guess we'll start on on that front, and uh, yeah, on that note, just cannot wait to get back on on Monday. I mean, I know it's not been that long, but well, it has kind of been that long since we've been at Celtic Park. Because I guess the last time was what start of December or something like that. Mm. I remember leaving Celtic Park at some point, well, the last game, and somebody said, "Oh, we're not back in here till the till the twenty ninth against Hibs." And that felt a long time at that point. So now it's gone right through till till now, and, and obviously, and in actual fact, I wouldn't have been able had the game been on um, on the 29th, I would have missed it because um, I was DJing a wedding that night. So um, thank you, Celtic, and the other uh, uh, the other nine clubs for thinking of me when you were at the table, the negotiating table, to bring forward the winter break. That's much appreciated. I know. It was all about agendas and everything else, wasn't it? So I'm glad that you got my got my email. Ah, the memo, absolutely. The, the only other thing I would say prior to talking about getting back into the stadium is, I think we're all of the opinion that there are certain players whose time at the club is up. They will be moved on, uh, either permanently or a loan to buy during hopefully this this January transfer. But there is a player where. You know, he's kind of gone under the radar in that he's been out the picture due to injury. He's back training. Um, he's been overshadowed by the arrival of Mieda, for example, um, and it's Yakamakis. So he's obviously come in after, a, you know, the best season of his career 
in, in a quality division, but not with a quality team. He's coming to Celtic, stop start. But I don't, I don't think uh, he's a player that we can write off. So I understand why all the focus is going to be on the new signing and obviously on Kyogo. But mm-hmm. Yakamakis may well have a part to play between now and the end of the season as well, JP. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, I, I saw a clip of um, Ange Postacoglu talking about the two Greek players. Uh, with a, I think it was a Greek TV station or or, or, or something. Like that. I'm not entirely sure what it was, but he was talking about Jackamakis and sort of you know get vouching for him, believing in him. Um, so it makes you think that 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 he had a hand in that transfer, and it wasn't one of these ones that's just been handed to him. You know, um, I, I, I don't really get the impression that that Ange Postecoglou is the type of guy that would take players just being handed to him and maybe that's naive on my part and uh, I certainly know one person listening and watching to the watching this that'll be laughing right now and going oh you, you're so naive you know you that of course that's what happens you know that's just football but you know I, I it's maybe I'm just a a fantasist on that on that level to think that you know this has suddenly all changed and the manager is responsible for the signings and that's it full stop like we've always wanted like we've always wanted because he lives or dies in this game, in this in this role, in this job for the people that he signs and lets go. Mm-hmm. And there was all the talk last week about Ewan Henderson going. If you and Hend- I, I thought about that after the bullet and just thinking, there's not that many players that have left Celtic like Ewan Henderson that have gone on to turn around and sort of say, well, you know, you let us go. Look at me now. I'm playing for X team or, or Y team. There's not that many that, that I can remember in my, in my lifetime, anyway. Um, just that it's it's never the grass is never always greener. I think Henderson will probably go on to have a good career, but is he going to become a twenty million pound player who Celtic will rue the day that they let you know go to Hibs for a nominal fee? I, I, I don't think so. And that's no disrespect to him, um, but I just don't think that's going to be the case. So with Jack and Marcus, I. Uh, We've only seen glimpses of him. There's points that are, he's been he's looked good. Ferenc Varos, when he came on, looked mm-hmm. like the option that we needed is somebody to be strong and hold up the ball. And then obviously you miss a penalty in the last minute in a crucial league game at home. That's going to turn a lot of people's uh, opinion against you. And it's now, for, for him, it's now about trying to win those doubters back. Um, I certainly wouldn't go. Oh well, he's no use because he missed a penalty. Do you know what I mean? I mean, Henrik Larsson missed penalties if if I remember rightly. <laughs> so uh, you know, he's only human. Um, if he comes back and and starts contributing, whether that's scoring goals, assisting in any way, if people see that he's you know wanting to knuckle down and and, and fight for fight for the cause, then. Then I'm sure that penalty miss will be will be forgotten. I just I just hope he's he can get to a level of fitness that he's able to do that because yeah. there will be anything more frustrating than sitting there wanting to contribute but you can't because you've got a knock or you know you're carrying this or a long term injury or whatever. So we'll see how it plays out. Fresh start, JP. Fresh start yeah. for the, the two guys uh, on the headlines, Julian and Forrest, this season, and hopefully another fresh start for uh, Yakamakis. Just want to give everybody a shout out who's joined us on all the various platforms that we're going out on. Alan Robertson, good afternoon, and uh, to yourself as well, Lanky67, and to Paddy and everybody else who's getting involved. Jungle Lion, maybe Jota hasn't signed because he doesn't want to. Uh, I think the longer that goes on, the more worried we get because we have got this affinity already with Alexi Jota and uh, Cameron Carter-Vickers as well. Sean, I remember um, Colin Watt mentioned that we should bring six players in in January. And although nobody scoffed at him, we thought that's a bit ambitious. Um, Sean F reckons that we still need another attacking midfielder, possibly two with Turnbull's injury, a centre and a half and another wide player. Now, we're brought in 4-1, I expect to be a Celtic B player um, coming over from Ireland, Sligo Rovers, and I think he's been brought in in the same kind of vein as Joey Dawson, for example. Um, but we've brought in three Japanese players. The one player that got away, it would appear, is somebody who we have been speaking about in Riley McGree. Um, and he's one of the guys that, you know, the name is mentioned, JP, and like everybody else, you go and do as much research as you possibly can so that you can discuss it on the bulletin. 
Um, and it did look as though we were at an advanced stage, but we're being gazumped, if that's the right word, by Middlesbrough. And that then um, is met with the usual and the expected kind of... Um, I don't. I didn't see any outrage from Celtic fans, but what you get is you get a lot of people within the media saying that's because the Championship's a better level than the Scottish Premiership. And that whole argument uh, rages on. This is down to money, isn't it? Riley McGree has gone in Middlesbrough because he's been offered more money. It's as simple as that. It, it would appear so, yeah. I mean, I know that he's obviously played in that league with Birmingham City so you know he knows the he knows the environment and probably knows that it's maybe his level to, you know to, to to sort of push on I mean what age is he 23 I'd never heard of the guy before last week so I'm not you know crying into my cornflakes about it um, it's one of those that's you know sounded good for a brief moment and you started thinking okay he's worked with Ange Postacoglu he's you know, clearly a sort of hot property. I saw somebody, sorry to bring up them again, but I saw somebody slagging off the fact that we were saying somebody for Birmingham City. I think Joe Aribo came from Charlton, so to be putting any uh, digs in at Celtic for trying to sign players from the Championship or, or whatever is just absolute nonsense. And I know that was just one voice. It wasn't thousands of people. But, yeah, anyway, I, I've got no problem with a Celtic shop to buy players, especially when... It's Ange Postacoglu that's signing the checks because I didn't have a problem with him going to Japan and getting Kyogo Furuhashi. Kyogo Furuhashi gave me one of the best days of my life as a Celtic supporter at Hampden Park last month. So, you know, I, I don't care where players come from. Um, it's, 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 it's not about the, the league that they're coming from. It's about what the manager thinks he can do with those players. And Riley McGree may or may not have been a good player for Celtic, but you think back to... I don't know if you've ever heard Chris Sutton talking about his options when he was coming to Celtic. Yeah. Mid Middlesbrough was one of them. And he went, <laughs> do I want to go to Middlesbrough and play up front with Hamilton Ricard or do I want to go to Celtic and play with Chris, uh, play with Henrik Larsson? Hmm, let me think about that. <laughs> uh, I mean, so, I mean uh, the, and, and, but the thing is, maybe at that point, we matched Middlesbrough for the monetary thing. But I think Chris Sutton was well off enough at that point to be able to make a decision based on football yeah. rather than money. Riley McGree is only 23. He's obviously at that weird age where it's like, right, I need to do something now and make a name for myself now. Am I going to do it quicker in England? Maybe. Um, so I, I don't hold any grudges against the guy for choosing. I, I, I wouldn't start slagging him for going to Middlesbrough over Celtic. I know... A lot of people have said, "Oh well, if you're going to choose Middlesbrough over Celtic, then that says a lot about you as a as a as a person, you know." Because, like, well, sixty thousand at Celtic Park, but I think that's just that's just the sort of fan in you saying that, you know. If you actually take the the Celtic specs off and go, wait a minute, this guy's got a decision to make about his life <laughs> and his career, um, and you know, unfortunately, I, we don't even know how far down the line we were with him as a as a player, as a as a signing. We don't know mm. if it was the case if he was almost on a flight to Glasgow and then, you know, got a flight to uh, Newcastle instead. Or uh, You've no idea. So it, it might, we might have pulled the plug a lot earlier. It's all paper talk, not in the know. <laughs> so You say that. Um, but, I mean, it's happened in the past, JP, and get the Ginola klaxon out because it happened with David Ginola and I'm thinking, I can't just use that as an example. So can you remember the other example with uh, Mark de Gries? Remember Mark de Gries? So he was the Belgian internationalist. He was a goal scorer. He played for Anderlecht and in 1995 Celtic looked to be on the verge of signing him and he went to Sheffield Wednesday. Can you remember de Gries? I, I, I'm trying to remember that, like, because as soon as you said that, I was like, do you mean Mark de Vries as in the Hearts player? And then I'm trying to remember the spelling of de Gries. How did you spell de Gries? It was D-E-G-R-Y-S-E, -E, Mark, as in Mark Bolin yeah. with a C. Yeah. yeah, I remember it now. I remember it now because it was it was at that point where if we got linked with any you know player from outside of Scotland, your immediate your ears immediately picked up and you're thinking, wow, this guy could be good because that was that was post Pierre, wasn't it? It was, and and at that time, you know, Tommy Burns had opened up the markets. You're talking about the, the markets that Andrew's shopping in. Tommy Burns opened up the markets at Celtic. You know, when he took over, and you're looking at the the makeup of that squad. 
um, there were very few non-UK players in terms of their um, their birth. So you had Rudy Vata. He was part of the squad. He came in mm-hmm. under Liam Brady. Uh, but very few. And then, you know, he, he brings in Pierre. And then he starts to bring in Morton Vickhorst came in. Uh, obviously, he'd been playing in, in Scottish football, but he comes in. Um, and then, the you know, the three amigos plus Tom. But we were looking in different markets. And Mark de Grease was one of the players that the paper talk was that he was on the verge of signing. But, it's ha- you know, it's happened so many times. I'm not getting too excited about it. But I do wonder... When I seen his name, it came out of nowhere, uh, I guess. Will Ange Postacoglu still be looking for a similar type player because he's lost out on this one? Is he still going to be looking for that attacking midfielder? Yeah, well, uh, that's that's something that I was quite interested in because last week, at some point, or one of the days last week, it seemed like we were being linked with a ridiculous amount of players, more than I can remember of an of a normal uh, sort of transfer window, it was it was. I know everyone always says it's like silly season, but I mean we were, you know, pretty much putting uh, markers down in so many different countries. You know, Iran, uh, you know, America. Um, there, there was there was others as well. There was it was not Algeria, uh, an Algerian guy, the French guy as well. I mean, it was there was a good four or five. So how those those links have all transpired, whether it's agents leaking it to, to the papers or whether it's clubs leaking it to try and build up interest in their players. I don't know, but there's no smoke without fire. Those, those are, surely those aren't just random links. So maybe all those links are his sort of one, two, three, four, five, and we don't know what number Riley McGree was in that mm-hmm. list of one, two, three, four, five. So I, I don't think... Again, maybe I'm giving too much credit to Ange Postecoglou. He doesn't seem like the type of guy that would just throw all his eggs in one basket and then be left red faced when uh, someone decides to go to a different a different club. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think he's he's I think he's probably far too experienced and long in the tooth um, to just be like, oh well, we're getting him. Looks like that's going to be fine. And then you know have it have it have him have a shirt number for him before he's even in the door. I think there'll be, you know, there'll be other options, and I'm kind of excited to see who else who else he brings in. Um, no, I, I'm excited as well. I mean, the whole process that a big part of it now, JP, is, is there's a, a whole game where the the, the market um, is being, uh, you know. It's been dealt with by agents, so the agents are leaking information here or there to try um, and orchestrate moves. You know, so a lot of the time, the the information is leaked to trusted reporters, and you've got Fabrizio Romano coming out. Uh, here we go, and he's one of the first to know. And if he tweets out, you're thinking it's happening, kind of thing. So a lot of that is agent. Uh, there's a big game with the agents, and and sometimes. I guess, and I'm not saying this happened with Riley McGree, but sometimes Celtic will be getting used as a pawn in the bigger game to get a move elsewhere, and and that will be happening as well. Uh, One of the big stories on the way out last uh, week was that we had interest for Stephen Welsh from Udinese. Uh, We had an interesting conversation last week about the success of some of the Scottish youngsters who have gone out uh, to Italy, and uh, you know Henderson and Hickey being two of them, both had been in at Celtic. Hickey, of course, never played for the first team. Um, but th- there seems to be this newfound kind of uh, respect for Scottish stock coming through. They would, uh, you know, go for a player like Stephen Welsh. It looks as though our old pal Brennan Rogers um, has kind of moved a few pawns himself because Benkovic is undergoing a medical at Udinese. He was freed uh, by Leicester just uh, yesterday, I think it was. Uh, and when, what do you make of the, the the Welsh interest? And again, it's not one of the moments where it's like, I've always said he's a great player. I've always championed Welsh. I think he's still developing. He's far from being a finished article. But it is interesting when a club in Serie A are coming and making an offer, be that a loan deal or permanent for Welsh. Well, I mean, it's, it seemed to be getting kind of derided and ridiculed on online from what I saw, you know, saying that's a nonsense, like why would, why would Udinese be going for Stephen Welsh? But I mean, why wouldn't they? You know, I mean, why why did Liam Morrison go to Bayern Munich? Mm-hmm. You know, why is Nathan Patterson gone to Everton? There's, there's a, a whole of the questions you can fling up there. And I'm putting Patterson in deliberately because he's hardly played any games <laughs> for, 
for uh, for Rangers, and suddenly he's going for ten million quid to Everton. You know, like mm. it's. It, I, I don't. I don't think you can. You know, it's about what the, a, a club sees in a player and what they think they can do with that player. They're not signing. Everton aren't signing a finished article in Nathan Patterson. Udinese wouldn't be signing a finished article in Stephen Welsh. You know, it's about what they think they can do with that player and what they see in that player at this stage in their career that they think they can better and mould. And, you know, it wouldn't have been a terrible move for him, but I, I'm, I'm glad that he's... It, this would not be the window where we want to lose any players that have been contributing to the first team. And he is definitely a player that's been contributing to the first team. So... Um, I, I certainly wouldn't begrudge him the move if they came back in the summer and you know there was a deal to be had. I would be disappointed because it's a Scottish player and you don't want to see your Scottish homegrown players leave. Um, but it all depends on how Celtic see him uh, developing in the future as a Celtic player because if mm-hmm. if it's laid out to him that, the, the, that he's not in their plans like Ewan Henderson, then... Obviously, there's a discussion to be to be had at that point. I would say, but I mean, it, I was saying it last week. It's amazing for a Scottish player. It would be amazing for a Scottish player. Welsh won't remember, <laughs> tragically, won't remember the nineties and Gazette of Football Italia and that that hype about Italian football. That'll be lost in him. That'll be like retro nostalgia that he might see on YouTube or something like that. Whereas. Unfortunately, you and I remember Sunday afternoons, you know, after Little House in the Prairie or the Waltons or Land of the Giants, Italian football came on and, and that was your afternoon, you know, watching George Weah and, you know, uh, Len, Lentini and all everybody, all of those guys were phenomenal. I, there was never a bad game, really, in, in, in that period. Um, it didn't look like there was a bad game last night between Inter and Juve as well. I wish I'd watched that, but... Um, I know just to get the experience and going over and playing in Italy and the lifestyle and you know I'm sure uh, Liam Henderson is is a is a good person to phone to ask about it. I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure he's not having a bad time over there. Um, no, definitely you know, not. Personal life or 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 on on the pitch. You know. See the big thing there though JP, I don't know why there was a surprise because some of the examples you've mentioned where uh, young Scottish talent has gone on to become a success uh, either down south or in Italy for example, I mean the success of Hickey and Henderson, there, there's teams said to have been interested in Hickey in the English Premiership during this transfer uh, window to bring them over from, from Italy, then you look at the I'm not even going to say half a dozen because there's more that have left the, the kind of Celtic Academy and gone elsewhere. They've gone to Watford, they've gone to Blackburn and Liverpool and Bayern Munich. A couple of them have gone to Bayern Munich. So it's quite clear that there are Scottish academies that are producing talented players who can take that step up, albeit mm. over a period of it's you know a, a few years of development. The Rangers' success story so far, I guess, would be Billy Gilmer, who's gone away down south, and you know we're talking Champions Leagues, we're talking uh, playing at Wembley for Scotland against England, you know, and then what does that do for the reputation of of that um, kind of stable? Well, it, it means that you might pay £10 million for another guy coming through. And I think that Celtic are in a similar situation. So I wasn't that surprised. Um, Looking at, interestingly, and I'm not going to say we should have gone for this guy, uh, but looking at the guy who's gone the other way and placed Welsh, perhaps, in Benkovic, a player who uh, Leicester spent £13 million on, right? He's played 40 games in four years. That's not 40 starts. He's had four loan deals out. That's how we know about him. He came to Celtic for a spell. I liked mm-hmm. him as a player, but far too injury prone by the looks of him. Yeah. And you look at him and, and you look at Simunovic, the two uh, players at the back, you know, at, at some point you looked at their ages, early 20s, you thought to yourself, you know, both had uh, changed hands, 13 million for Benkovic, six and a half, I think, uh, was the, the fee for Simunovic. How much did we pay for Simunovic? Was it four and a half? And then Torino wanted them for six. You yeah. know, these these guys have, since that period of time four years ago, barely kicked a ball in senior football. So, yeah. you know, we wish them all the best. Hopefully that move works out for them as well. It just, shows you, it just shows you we are not, like other clubs aren't immune to making bad moves and bad mistakes in the, in the transfer market. You know, like that, you just cited 13 million for Benkovic and he's barely barely contributed to Leicester. Two games it's, for Leicester he's played. Two it's games. The same for us. 
with um, with like the likes of Ayeti and Barkas. Mm-hmm. Only we got probably more out of them than than obviously Leicester got out of Benkovic because Benkovic spent time away on loan at, at, at Celtic, obviously, and did he not go somewhere else as well? Did he go to? He did because he went to Bristol uh, City. Um, and he also there was a there was an interview last season when John Kennedy says that they were on he was on Celtic's radar again, mm. um, and he, I think he ended up in Belgium. Yeah, on, I was on yeah. that's right. I um, I so I mean it just shows you that that that, that you know transfer transfers are a, a, a strange uh, a strange world. You know where you know mm. not everything works out as you would expect. You know I mean when when Benkovic went back to Leicester. I kind of fully expected, and when Mar- uh, sorry Brendan Rodgers came in, I fully expected having he having worked with them already, fully expected them to sort of make his way into the team and 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 start playing. But for whatever reason, I mean, I'll be I'll be interested to see how how he develops at Udinese and see how he gets on there. Gets on there because um, it's it's a weird one. I don't even know what age Benkovic is. I couldn't tell you what age he is. I I, I would guess sort of mid twenties. Where is it? He's 24, but he'll be turning 25 in the summer. So. Yeah, and with not a lot of games in the last couple of years, it's, no. it's a strange one. But I just I was looking earlier on when we were talking about Julian because I wanted to find the team that night against Dundee United. So when he stopped that goal from going in, which did look like a certain goal, um, I think the score was 2-0. Mm-hmm. I think we were winning 2-0. And then we scored the third. If, if that's what I remember, anyway, obviously wasn't at the game. I was sitting watching it, and here in an empty stadium. But um, the team that night, I just I wanted to find it. The team that night. This is this is the 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 world of Celtic that Julian left in December twenty twenty, and the world that he's coming back to. So the goalkeeper was Barkas. Mm. Right back was Frimpong. He was centre half with Christopher Ayer. Laxalt was at left back. The midfield was Sorrow, Christie, Turnbull, and McGregor, and up front was Griffiths and Edward. So you know that that's like a completely different, <laughs> completely different uh, Celtic, really. I mean, I know you've got the, you've got McGregor still there, and Turnbull. But currently, Turnbull's injured. Um, Sorrow's nowhere to be seen. Barkas is halfway out the door. Laxalt's gone. Frimpong's gone. Ayer's gone. Christie's gone. Griffiths may as well be gone, and Edward's gone. So incredible! You know, it's weird to think that that is what was, what was then, and what is now. You know, it is, and in a relatively short space of time, not to yeah. Julian's career to have lost it over a year. But it, it leads us on to this question from Kevin Mack: Where does Julian fit? this new system that he's coming into then. Because I always look back on Julien, and I know that people go on about the times where apparently he was spooked by a big centre-half and all this kind of stuff. I thought he was comfortable with the ball at his feet. I thought he had a range of passing. He was good long passing, short. He was good in the air. Um, where does he fit Angie's system? I don't think he's anywhere near being a similar player to Starfelt in terms of you know, how is he going to work as a foil to Cameron Carter Vickers, who is your first choice centre half every day of the week? Um, mm. I think he fits it pretty well because he does have that distribution. So he can play it out, out from the back, he can play it out to the inverted um, full backs. And, and what he's going to offer, and we've spoken about this all season, if he gets back to his full fitness, and I really hope he does, is more of an aerial threat at set pieces offensively. Because, I mean, you know, people still say that we're, we're not quite there defensively, but we've improved massively from last season, JP. Mm-hmm. Ah, he, scored at rugby, he scored at Rugby Park, I think. Um, remember with a header just before, in that run of games at the start of 2020, um, mm-hmm. before before everything fell away because of COVID. And when we were, playing, when we were on that run, playing really well, when he scored the header at, at Rugby Park, obviously scored in the... In the Lazio game um, and and uh, the cup final as well, so you know it's it, you know he has he has that in his locker to 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 do some damage at the other end of the park, and it has been frustrating to not get goals from centre half because at one point I'm sure he was on heading towards double figures for a season. Aye. Um, yep. I, I, I can't remember now because it's it feels honestly feels like about three or four years since I saw Julian play for Celtic, just purely because of COVID. Like, everything seems to have been shifted a couple of years 
you know, uh, because of that. So I, I can't remember. Normally, my memory would be good for that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, he's definitely. I remember at one point thinking, "Wow, he's got more goals than most of our strikers, um, and strikers of other teams in in the league as well." You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. so you can't you can't you can't really put a price on that to get a can to get a return from a centre half uh, in terms of goals is 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 massive, um, and it just it can dig you out of a hole. You know, you get a corner kick at some point in a game, you're struggling at nil nil, looking for a goal, St Mirren away. You know, I don't know how many corners we had in that game, but probably a, quite a few. Um, and and there you go. You've got a guy that of that height that can just pop up and as long as he times his jump right, he's going to probably beat most people in the air um, in Scotland. And uh, you've got you've got a good chance of a goal. So, um, I, I mean, I, just on Monday as well, somebody said to me that they don't think it'll be a full house because of the, the fact that there's so many Irish fans come over and it's a Monday night. So will those fans come over from Ireland on a Monday night? Will they be able to because of work and it's short notice? Um, so I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting they won't. I'm just saying I wonder, I wonder how it will be on Monday if it will be the full rocking stadium that we, we hope it will mm. be mm-hmm. or, 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 what, or what will happen in that front. You've also got the fact that people might still be wary Again, it's unlikely, but people might still be wary about COVID and might not go to the game as a result. So, you know, I'm I, I'm not saying it's not going to be good. Of course, it's going to be good, but I just wonder if it will be the full house that you know it's kind of it kind of should be. Yeah, definitely. And again, the commitment of the the travelling Irish fans to come to Celtic Park and. It's incredible every every single time oh, at home. It's unbelievable. But as you say, it's it's a big span on the works if it's a short notice and it's a Monday night and you know. I, I, it is. I mean, I know I heard something about when the rumours started to happen about that, that it would be from the seventeenth. And um, I heard that, that that flights started to get booked up really quickly for the 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 second of February. You know, with people just sort of gambling on the fact that they would be coming from Belfast or wherever, and and uh, and on that date. So, I, I don't know if people did the same for the Hibs game, and whether mm. you know buses have been booked, ferries have been booked, you know, all of that kind of stuff. It's just, it's 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 weird that like something like this would just happen with with like a week's notice or a, a week and a couple of days notice. It, it's a lot to ask people to shift their lives about for. You know, to 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 get over. Um, I mean, it's all right for me. I'm it's just a longer road for me. But you know, I, I'm thinking of people. There's not, it's not just Ireland. People travel from down south as well. And you know, um, I'm sure I'm sure further afield. So, um, but yeah, I'm just looking forward to to being there. Absolutely. I mean, you've you've obviously sparked a few memories from some of the people tuning in. JP, we're going to go for the full. Uh, the full hour. We're not going to wrap up five minutes early, uh, as some referees might want us to do, but we're not going to do that. Joe Porter, Roberto Baggio, absolutely. He was unbelievable. Then you've got, you know, Berezi coming into the the discussion here. Um, You've got Edgar Davids with the goggles, Maldini. Unbelievable. But there's a player, you mentioned Lentini, interesting, because he had was he £16 million pounds back then? Gianluigi yeah. Lentini, he signs yeah. for AC Milan. Then he's in a car crash. Yeah. And he's on a life support machine and all that yeah. kind of stuff. He's out for ages. Um, Giuseppe Signori, remember Signori for for Lazio? Unfortunately, that he played for them. But what what a player he was, and he, he enjoyed a cigarette from time to time as well. Uh, no, class, class, oh, Fiali, Fiali is smoking like like a chipper. I meant <laughs> no, absolutely, Marco van Basten. Deary, deary me, and no one. Uh, oh. Yes, absolutely. Jay, unbelievable. Uh, and, and I think he retired when he was 31, which which is bizarre as well because of injury. Oh, oh, yeah. Thank but he's you. part, t- talking about cigarettes and Marco Van Basten, he was part of the Ajax squad that came over in the early 80s to play Celtic. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was on that bus after the game at, at Celtic Park where somebody around about Parkhead has nicked the hamper at the Ajax coach with all the kits in it. And I, the kit man's come onto the bus. This came from Jan Moby, this story. I, I never tire of telling this one. And if you've seen the footage, Ajax, I think, were wearing the blue strips against us that night. Um, so the kit man comes onto the, the coach and says, in Dutch, I'm guessing, 
<laughs> somebody's nicked the hampers and he, 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 asked the, he asked the players to go and start chapping doors, right? <laughs> Outside Celtic Park, seriously. So they're all going into these blocks of flats. They're chapping doors looking for the Ajax kits that they've yeah. just worn against Celtic. The only player that never left the bus was Cruyff, who was sitting at the back having a cigarette. So he just sat there whilst the likes of Rygaard and Van Basten and Jesper Olsen and all these guys, Jan Moby, are knocking on doors looking for stolen Ajax kits. Where did they go? Leave a comment underneath the video if you know any more information. about Because it was Le Coq Sportif Ajax oh. jerseys. I had a full silver Lecoq Sportif tracksuit when I was about 11 or 12. Um, thought it was the bee's knees. Um, see, when you mentioned about a young Van Basten coming by Ajax, can you remember a young striker now of state renown in the game who was with Ajax in 2001? Where, oh, sorry. Aye, 2001, Martin O'Neill's uh, Celtic against Ajax. They had a young striker in the ranks. Oh, Ibrahimovic? Yes. Yeah, because yeah. I had the programme for the away game and he was on the front of it. Oh, was he? Oh, you got yeah. a programme? I, I, I was yeah. there, but I didn't get a programme. I've got, I've got my ticket, but I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm actually surprised I still have my ticket given the nick that I ended up in that night. But, um, uh, but no, the, 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 I, think, I think it was the, it was either the away leg or the home leg he came on for the second half. I think it may have been the second, the, 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 the away leg actually that he got brought on because obviously they were chasing the game because we were winning. And I think it, it, it was obviously that was his first big move, um, Zlatan at that point. Um, I'd, I'd, still the, ta- I'd still take him in the hoops. If you haven't read Zlatan Ibrahimovic's book, um, I Am Zlatan, get get it dealt with. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I, there's not many football players' books that I would read again. Uh, that's one, because he's... It's just, his pattern is absolutely unreal. Like the story about when Mino Raiola, um, we, we wanted to go to Barcelona, he was desperate to go to Barcelona, and he was just sitting there in his house one night. And Raiola had called him bluff and sort of said, It's not going to happen. And then he phoned him and he went, I've Got a plane ready for you to go to Barcelona. And he was like, What? And he just said, Pack a bag. And then he last minute packed a bag. And he was in the middle of playing FIFA. And he just threw his controller down, got up, packed a bag, left. Went away to Spain to sign for Barca, and then when he, by the time he came back, obviously forgotten how things were when he left. He walked in the house and he, he just heard this like blaring, like voice, like shouting, and he was like, "What the hell is that?" And he walked up the stairs. He'd left his PlayStation and telly on, and like it was just like the the commentary had just been like repeating and repeating, and he went, "Hi, <laughs> so what, what a guy." I mean that that's that's. That's just one story. There's hundreds of stories. I need to read it. I've not, I've not read that. It's, I do like a, an autobiography. Um, it's ridiculous. Like what he's what he's what he's achieved. The clubs he's played for. Absolutely, he's every right to be the arrogant B that he is. Because and, and he plays on it as well. You know, he plays on it as well. You know what I mean, JP? Listen, uh, we can't go off today without a big shout out to uh, Ronnie Spector. Now. You've got a record there. Let's see. Let's see this record. I I said before we came on that uh, this is my favourite song of all time. Be yeah, my that's, baby. That's my dad's copy of um, "Be My Baby" by the Renettes. Um, my dad was a DJ in in the Bradford and the surrounding areas in the in the sixties, and uh, he would play the kind of more like dance and pop stuff, and then his his mate. Um, that he DJed with played the heavier stuff, and uh, I've I've inherited all my dad's seven-inch singles, and I, I knew I had this, and uh, just seeing the like it's on see the imprint, so it was printed on London Records, but if you see it, it says Phyllis, right? Yeah, that was Phil Spector's label, so that the, the was released on Phil Spector's label through an imprint which was London Records, and. Uh, yeah, August nineteen sixty three that came out, and I, I played it last night on my on my on my uh, my stereo. It sounded brilliant, you know, just hearing a seven inch on decent speakers. Uh, I, it just it sounds amazing, and her voice sounds amazing, and yeah, just really really sad. I don't know if you saw the the performance that someone shared last night on YouTube, on uh, Twitter of um, she did be my baby with Jules Holland. Uh, oh. Pro- not that long ago, like with a with a band and Jules is on piano and I it's it's amazing. Like she's definitely 
uh, in her like sixties or seventies at this point when she's doing the doing the song, and her voice still sounds, you know, incredible. And I, uh, it's 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 really sad when you lose somebody, you know, like that. Um, especially somebody who I think was still performing even recently, you know, um, an absolute iconic voice and iconic song, like you said, "Be My Baby." You actually said controversially that it may be your favorite song of all time. But that's that's a high accolade to give any song. Um, so, I, I mean, it's, it's definitely one of mine. And, you know, when I've ever DJed and played it, when you hear those drums kick in, the crowd go mental for it. Because mm. obviously you've got the dirty dancing thing, which will be a big appeal, but then there's people amongst the crowd that just appreciate it for the amazing song that it is. And actually, first time I ever saw Glass Vegas covered Be My Baby at Cabaret Voltaire, 2007 or 8 I think it was maybe 2007 they were supporting a band and I saw them play in front of about 20 people and it was the original obviously the original lineup of Las Vegas and uh, they, they covered Be My Baby and I was just like what? Nice. Like what a bold move to cover Be My Baby <laughs> like that's not you know you, 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 you don't do that unless you're going to do it justice and they, and they did to be fair and like obviously James big massive uh, Spectre fan and and you know fan of all the music of that time so you know he was going to obviously put his heart and soul into it and, and he did and uh, I'm not sure if they ever recorded it or not but um, yeah there you go Magic, magic. What I'm going to say is thanks to everybody who's listening. If you're watching on YouTube, we are currently um, five away from hitting 16. In fact, we're one away from hitting 16,500 subscribers on YouTube. What's the point in subscribing on YouTube? Well, you get content every single day. We're working on big, big content, big Celtic content, music as well. Uh, there is a, an unplugged session coming out on Saturday night with a certain uh, Willie Doug. That's going to be coming to your um, ears on and your eyes on Saturday night. So that that's one to look forward to as well, JP. So get subscribing on there and get us up to 16,500 as we continue to build the channel and create even more Axom and music content. JP, it's always an absolute pleasure on a, on a Thursday to speak to you for an hour about Celtic and a wee bit of music at the end. Um, enjoy Monday and have a great weekend. <laughs>